Sure. So my name is Olivia Pfeiffer. I graduated from, uh, from Villanova, class of 2022. I was a double major in economics and humanities with a minor in sustainability. And I now live in Philadelphia as the ESG reporting specialist at FMC Corporation, uh, which means that I'm on a corporate sustainability team doing things from the investor perspective. Um, and I'm Kate Redding. I actually did not graduate from Villanova. I went to Wake Forest down in North Carolina. Um, I was saying earlier, the schools are pretty similar, so I think that like hopefully what I have to share is fairly similar to like what the experience is like at Villanova. Um, I graduated in 2019, and I'm now over here at the law school, so I'm finishing up my second year, and I will graduate in 2024, and hopefully go into some kind of government work. Is what I'm So I thought it would be interesting to have different types of experiences. So it has gone into the workforce. Mary's Kate had a gap year before going into grad school. So to begin, I would like to have a conversation generally about budgeting. Uh, if you have suggestions about what you know and then what surprised you. Sure. Um, so it's definitely different, you know. So I started working immediately after college. So I basically got my first paycheck within a month of graduating, which was fantastic and exciting, um, and really cool to all of a sudden be like making an income. But definitely is um, had its challenges. I'm not gonna lie, right? It's I've never had to manage all of my living expenses on my own by myself before. Of you know, I'd spent summers like living as an intern or, you know, kind of at college, but I didn't really have to think too much about long-term savings because I wasn't quite at that point in my life yet. So, graduated, started working, woohoo, so exciting, um, and then quickly learned, like, ah, okay, I only, I only get paid once a month, which is a bit unusual, um, and wow, you know, I get paid on the 24th, and then all my bills are due on the 1st, and between the third and the next 24th, it sometimes was a, uh, you know, a bit challenging. Uh, not necessarily, you know, I am fortunate in the job that I have to be making a stable income, but just learning how to uh, manage that money properly, right? So having the living expenses of rent and why, you know, it's like, okay, I know I'm gonna have to pay rent, but then I'm gonna have to pay for Wi-Fi and heating and gas and electric and those kind of little things that you learn about or. You know, I, I, I'm making an income, but I, you know, pay for my own health care. So, oh, that's coming out of my paycheck every month. Um, kind of elements like that were definitely interesting to learn how to navigate. And, you know, I'm about a year out, and do I have it perfect? No, not at all. Um, but I've definitely learned a lot uh, in a variety of ways. I don't know if there's anything in particular you want to, like, in terms of things that I learned uh, about, if there's like any particular element, or do you have any suggestions about? I don't know if you have an idea of how how you would uh, divide or organize your finances. Yeah. So how I currently divide my finances is. Um, I split things into thirds, so I have about a third of my paycheck, um, so I have a 401k set up through work, and so I'm able to contribute, um, I contribute 15% of my monthly paycheck into a 401k, and then we actually have an employer contribution, or sorry, uh, my company matches up to 5%, which basically means at the end of the day, I have 20% of my paycheck annually going into a 401k, so I have a third going into savings, and then I have the other two thirds split pretty equally between uh, need to living expenses, right? So rent, utilities, phone bills, kind of that sort of uh, groceries. And then the other third is spent on fun, right? So um, dinners, trips, travel, you know. Though, you know, I would say like some of the fun is not always fun because like for example I graduated college and I you can see I'm in full professional dress like I had to build an entire new professional wardrobe and so that's something I had to learn how to do so yeah I have things approximately set up into thirds. I think 
grad school budgeting is a little different, especially for law school. So I know some programs might offer like a stipend or some kind of, you know, you can be a TA and make money that way. Um, across the board, law school does not offer that. So um, most law students are making zero income all the time and hoping to be paid over the summer. Most people generally are managing student debt, um, taking loans out. Loans will be paid for the academic year, which is something that I think a lot of people kind of forget, so that's nine months. There's three months in the summer unaccounted for that you need to kind of figure out a lot of the time. So most people are hoping for a paid internship, a stipend, something like that for the summer. And then a lot of people will kind of bank on going into big law, as it's called, which pays a lot of money on sort of a salary scale. So across the board, you're making a ton of money to kind of mitigate the student debt that you might have taken on um, to go to law school. So I think that budgeting when you have no income is very stressful um, and trying to, you know, you get your disbursement at one time and then looking at that and going, okay, I need to make this last uh, until the next time that I get one. Um, so I think kind of touching on student loans a little bit, um, a lot of the conventional wisdom with that if you're going to go to grad school is to just kind of choose somewhere where you can minimize that. I think especially with law school, that's very much the conventional wisdom. You're kind of balancing like, what's the best school that I can go to with the least amount of debt? And for me, that was Villanova. Um, so I have very little debt, which is great. Um, and then that's kind of why I wanted to take a gap year in the first place, um, was to have a little bit of that money. I wasn't sure if I wanted to commit to a grad program. So I worked for a year actually for a company, I'm not from the area, but for a company in Philly, um, just doing sort of customer service. Um, not really building a career since this is something that I thought I wanted to do later on, but just kind of having something during the pandemic um, to kind of stay afloat while I was living with my parents, which also, you know, that allowed me to kind of save during that year and now have a little bit of extra money to play with, play with, um, just to kind of make me feel a little more comfortable um, during this time. And then, you know, hoping for summers. Generally, people will be paid for one summer and not for the other. For most people who are kind of on that big law track that I talked about, which is generally like, pretty much what a lot of people are shooting for. They'll be unpaid their first summer doing something, you know, working for a judge, um, working for a nonprofit, and then going to their firm the next summer and receiving like a pretty hefty paycheck for the summer. So they kind of have that to stretch over usually their third year, and then they know what they're going into. Um, for me, this is just my experience. I was paid last summer working in private practice, and this summer I'm gonna be working for the federal government. So not being paid and hopefully going into more of a government career, which is, a little bit less on the paycheck side, great benefits, would highly recommend. Um, so I guess I just kind of think about like, I feel less like I'm splitting into thirds and I more look at like my essential expenses and then what I have left over. So I'm like, here's what I need to cover. You know, I need to cover rent, I need to cover groceries, I need to cover everything with having a car, which is something that really surprised me. Cars are so expensive. Shout out to my parents, like I gave me that car in high school that they had had and you know, pay for insurance and everything. So I think that was kind of a shock to be like, oh no, I have to pay for this now. Now the car is in my name. And uh, so I kind of look at it more like once I've covered everything that I need to cover for the month, what do I have left over that I can, you know, stretch and do things and not give up having a life just for the sake of, you know, having a little bit of extra money in my savings. You guys both mentioned rent. And as an undergrad, that's kind of been included in our tuition. So do you have any advice about or things that you were surprised about when you got your first apartment? So yeah, I will say I enjoy living in Philly after spending a summer in New York because I spend a lot more money in New York than I do in Philadelphia, and I have way more space. So that is the cost of living between cities is a very real thing. Um, and so I'm very grateful to be living in Philadelphia because I feel as though I'm able to do that third thing that I talked about, which was not, like when I was an intern in New York, I think I was, my intern salary was like five eighths of it was going towards my rent, and then the rest of it, I was like, well, we're gonna make this work. Um, so, you know, I, I feel grateful to live in Philadelphia. Um, things that surprised me about my first apartment. Um, there's a certain level, like I mentioned, those kind of extra utility costs were never something I had to think about before of not just paying rent, but then all those other little things. Um, and then also learning how to build up having a, a house, quote unquote, for the first time. I think that it's a really cool opportunity at Villanova that you live on campus all four years. I'm not sure what it was like at Wake Forest, but 
I didn't need anything for my dorm, right? I moved in, I had a bed, I had a dresser, I had, you know, maybe we got some kitchen supplies, but I didn't need anything. And then all of a sudden you move into an apartment and you're like, I have to buy a couch and I have to buy a rug and I have to buy a car. You don't have to, right? But you want to, right? There's a certain uh, amount of things you're like, oh, like I, I go to get a glass of water and I, I don't have a glass to drink out of, right? Like there's just some, there was just some of those, uh, this is kind of for that like initial period of time where I was like, oh wow, like it's going to take some, like, and that's something for me that I learned is I moved into my place in June and I was like, this place is going to be so put together by like July. It's going to be perfect. I don't think I got my apartment to where I feel like I have all the elements I want in terms of like decor or like desk, nightstand, bookshelf. It took me till December to like really acquire everything for my apartment to kind of build up a living space because I didn't have a lot of the, you know, I moved into my apartment with two suitcases of clothes basically from Villanova and that was about it. So. Um, Learning how to build that up was definitely interesting and took a little bit more time than I was anticipating, but I'm glad that I stretched it out over time because, I mean, I had to stretch it out over time. I couldn't have spent all my money on all the different furniture things right away, but that was a new experience for me, for sure. I think in terms of rent, there's a lot of balancing of, like, location that you might want, amenities that you might want versus cost, obviously. Um, so I think for a lot of people, roommates is the solution. Um, and I would say, kind of regardless of where you're going, something that I wish I had done more of is like, be able to put yourself out there. Like I'm thinking about that a lot now, not necessarily knowing what city I'll end up after I finish my program, being like, mm, who do I know that lives in DC? Who do I know that lives in New York? Can I crash on their couch for a weekend while I'm taking an interview? Did they know anybody that's subletting? Did they know anybody that needs a roommate? Um, I know one of my friends that lives in DC uh, moved into a house with like someone she vaguely knew and three other girls. And they ended up just having kind of a room that they rotate out. That's like someone new is coming to the city. They're moving here for the first time. We're going to let them stay, you know, for six months, for a year. And then we'll rotate someone else in, right? So they live in more of like a townhouse um, versus an apartment. But I think for most grad students, the answer is usually roommates. Again, this is one of the huge benefits of taking a gap year um, is that I do have that little bit of savings that I can use to live in a one bedroom by myself which for me has been really great. I think that's the other thing to balance, right? Like having your own space is so fun and exciting. And I did kind of the same thing. I think building up and like furnishing an apartment is really fun. It's also a little bit of sticker shock. We had the same thing at Wake Forest. We lived on campus all four years, so didn't have anything, went through kind of the same experience. Um, but I think that roommates is a really common experience and that kind of balancing will also help offset some of the costs of starting up, right? You can, you know, split a couch, you can split a rug, you can kind of figure out the Venmo situation. I know that my friends that have roommates are like constantly figuring out Venmo, so it can be a little contentious. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to live with roommates anymore after I get out of college. I can't wait to not have that, but it's not as bad as it seems and it does, of course, offset the cost of rent as well as a lot of that like startup costs that you might be having when you're trying to get an adult life for the first time. And also, if you don't know anyone, I met my roommate on Facebook. I yeah. like fully, I put some, I posted on a Facebook group and said, hi, I'm moving to Philly. This is the neighborhood I'm looking to move into. This is my like budget approximately. And basically they went on a bunch of roommate dates with a ton of different people. And she graduated from Temple and we ended up becoming friends. So I mean, absolutely reach out to people if you have those loose ties. I'm a huge fan of the loose ties thing, but um, also, don't be afraid of, like, I didn't know my roommate a year ago, and now I consider her one of my best friends, so, um, not to be like, go, go live with a stranger from the internet, but, uh, it, it, it is a really, as you said, it's a great way to offset costs and kind of figure all those different elements out, um, and living with a roommate post-grad is nothing like living in a dorm room with a roommate, so it is so much better. I promise you, it's definitely a good time. Are there any other tips you have about managing a tight budget? I think as far as being on a tight budget, one of the things that I kind of started doing is, especially in your first couple months, something that I found really helpful was, obviously you're concerned about saving money. Just give yourself a little bit of grace and take maybe one or two months to just see, like, if I don't have, you know, if I'm not using an app to budget or a spreadsheet or, like, writing down or tracking everything that I'm budgeting, 
what am I spending, right? Like, what are groceries going to cost me? Where do I have things? Like, what subscriptions do I have that I absolutely want to keep, right? Like, I'm not going to get rid of Spotify, you know? I'm not going to get rid of Netflix. I'm not going to get rid of HBO or, like, whatever streaming services I have because those things are adding value to my life. That means I maybe shop, like, a little bit less online, whereas I have friends that are, like, I would rather, you know, spend money and get a couple new clothes once a month versus, you know, whatever it is that I spend on, like, a hobby. I have a rock climbing gym that I like to go to, right? So that's something that, like, adds value to my life. So I think taking a little bit of time to just see, like, where do I spend my money? Which will also point out to you, like, is there anywhere that I'm wasting money? Like, are there any subscriptions that I have that I'm not using, that I haven't used for an entire month and now I'm getting billed again and I'm, you know, losing $10 or whatever. So I think giving yourself that little bit of grace to just kind of see, like, where your spending actually goes is really helpful then when you kind of get into being like, okay, groceries cost 70 bucks twice a month. Now I know that, you know, can I bring that up or down, right, if I'm being more conscious? So I think that taking, like, what you're actually spending on the things that give your life value and then turning that into your budget is really helpful because then you don't end up cutting out, like, you don't just sit around and be like, oh my god, I have no joy in my life and I'm constantly worried about money. I'm definitely worried about money, like, pretty frequently, not in, like, a life-altering way. I have the money that I need to cover the things that I need and some of the things that I want, which is really nice. But don't don't feel like you have to cut out everything in your life. Figure out like where you can balance on things that matter more to you versus things that matter less. And some things that are going to matter to you aren't going to matter to as you said, right? Exactly. Like there are some things that are really a priority for some people that might not be a priority for you. Um, I'm going to go off of that and I'll give two pieces of advice. The first is I know you said you don't have to worry about an app, but I use an app called Oops, and basically what it is is it's similar to a um, dating app in which you swipe right or left and so every month or I have like my credit card and my debit card loaded on there and so every time I have a transaction it asks me to sort it into a different category there you go swipe this is transportation this is food this is rent right and so at the end of every month I'm able to see what goes into each category and then I'm able to star some things as oops categories right so if it said hey, you spent X amount of money on clothing this month, I can be like, hmm, that's a bit of an oops category, right? Like, I really, sh that shouldn't be that high. And so I've really enjoyed using that app. Um, I've tried a bunch of them, and I found that that one is the most simplistic and yet kind of effective way for me to see what exactly I'm doing with my money and then kind of make those little adjustments. So not to plug an app, but to plug an app, I really... Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I would also recommend You Need a Budget, um, YNAB, if you've never tried it before. That was one that I found really helpful when I was first setting it up. I like to do mine on a spreadsheet in Google Sheets, so it's not automated, which is kind of annoying. I'll, like, keep an eye on YNAB, or Mint, I think, is the other one, um, which if you use, like, TurboTax, it'll just connect to your TurboTax, so that's always really nice, especially around this time of year. Uh, but yeah, I, I think apps are great, like, and that one sounds super helpful to be like, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. But it just kind of helps you see, like, where your money's actually going, which I think is really helpful, because then you can see, like, oh, I forgot that I was paying for, like, this random thing that I forgot to cancel the trial of. So then you can go ahead and cancel it. And it just helps you, like, be more aware of that stuff. And then the second thing that I would recommend doing is, um, this comes from personal experience, of making sure that you establish a savings account. Um, I was in a position of putting everything into checking or investments. And so, like I said, I put stuff into 401k, and obviously there's a certain amount of privilege, the fact that I'm able to allocate money towards investments, but those were, I basically graduated college, depleted my savings account, and then it was investments and checking. Um, and then my landlord told me he was selling our apartment. And all of a sudden, I was going to have to come up with a couple thousand dollars of moving costs that I didn't have. And I ended up having to pull some money, like, okay, so then I ended up having to pull some money out of investments. I had to, like, panic and reallocate my spending for two months. Um, and if I had just been better about putting a little bit of that money that I was walking into, you know, investments into an emergency savings fund, I still would have had a little bit of panic of, oh my gosh, I have to pay a first month's rent and security deposit somewhere and moving and all of the costs associated with that. But I would have been better equipped to handle that, so um, just just a word of I, I can offer you any advice. Don't do that. Cause that was that was a bad mistake on my part when it came to budgeting. That connects to another question I had, which was, do you have any experiences where you've had changes in plans and how did you? Yeah, I 
think one of my biggest tips that's like pretty conventional wisdom for budgeting is definitely have an emergency savings fund. I know the app that I bank with, you can set up like buckets in your savings account. So I have a bucket for emergencies that I don't touch otherwise. The other money I might, you know, take some out when I'm running a little low. I try not to dip into like my savings that much and just keep an eye on what I have and checking when I'm, you know, I like to keep everything separate. But having that bucket that I know is going to be there, and it's not huge, but it's there, and it's there in case uh, last semester I hit somebody's car in a parking lot. I backed into someone's car, um, and that was deeply unfortunate. Um, it was my bad. But I have insurance, and I had that account to cover what insurance didn't, and that just, you know, it happened. I was upset. I was stressed out about it, but I wasn't, you know, my immediate first thought wasn't, oh my god, how am I going to pay for this? Because I was like, you have that money that's set aside that you wouldn't touch in any other situation. I know friends have had experiences, like with pets, having that money set aside when it's like, oh my god, my dog just ate a sock and now we have to go to the vet and it's going to cost a thousand bucks for them to get the sock out of my dog. Like, knowing that you have that money set aside, I think, really quells a lot of the anxiety, especially when you know that it's just there and you don't touch it otherwise. And I think having like the bucket or, you know, a separate savings account or something where you can delineate it is really helpful because then you're less tempted to kind of dip into it. Um, but that's like my number one tip is an emergency fund for sure. Did you put all your, like, did you put a chunk of change into there and then not touch it or did you allocate a little bit at a time? So I started with a chunk and then that's exactly what I did. Like I was getting paid over the summer, like I said, so everything from that I would take a little bit and put it in there and then take a little bit and put it in my savings and leave a little bit in my checking account for fun. Uh, so that you can see it kind of grow. And I know that's a good way to save for really anything. Um, I don't know if you do that, but I know a lot of people will call it like a sinking savings account. So if you're like, mm, I really want to go on vacation this summer, then every time you get paid, put a little bit of money into like a vacation savings account and you can watch it grow and then you'll have that money ready for you when you're ready to spend. Yeah, so I, um, like I said, I work in uh, corporate sustainability, and sustainability is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, so, like, something for me is that it was important for me to align like, my values with what I wanted to do long term. Um, and I recognize that I, again, I'm, I'm in a position of privilege that I'm getting paid well, and I'm doing something that I'm really passionate about. I recognize that that's often kind of a, a juggle that people struggle to find, um, but that was something that kind of really motivated me um, when I was, you know, because I did things that I loved and wasn't getting paid at all, that like literally was not paid, and then I did things that I didn't like at all and was making a lot of money doing, and you know, I, I had an offer for a job after my junior year of college with a firm, um, but it just, it, and I could have gone and been, you know, very successful, quote unquote, and made a ton of money and also would have been miserable and would have been really sad, right? And so uh, it took a lot of courage to turn down that job offer. My parents thought I was crazy, for sure. Um, but I, I, it's something that I'm glad that I did. Um, and, you know, again, I, I'm lucky that it worked out the way that it did. I, I recognize that there's a lot of luck that goes into these situations, for sure. But um, yeah, definitely, I guess the, the advice that I would give is choose something that you're passionate about, but also it is okay if money matters to you in the job that you're pursuing, right? I think that there's sometimes a, um, we should only be doing things that we love and that the money shouldn't matter at all. But we've been talking here about you need an emergency, like if, if you want an emergency savings or you want to uh, go on a vacation or all of these different things, right? I think that it's not bad to consider the financial future of your p future career. And like, I sometimes feel like people demonize that unfairly. Um, so I guess I'm kind of like splitting both sides, which is a bit of a non-answer, but it's, it's out there and I encourage you to pursue it. I mean, I think that's a huge point. I think 
especially when you're choosing to kind of go to grad school, like you are delaying building your career and you're also kind of delaying making money for a little while. Some people would call that putting off the real world, but I think especially with things where you have a very defined career path at the end of it, so like law, medicine, I would say PhD and there are always like tons of different master's degrees where you're like, I'm getting this degree to do specifically this. Um, when you look at your options, there's usually like the conventional track that makes more money and then like maybe an unconventional track that makes a little less money. I think that's huge. Choosing a career that's going to set you up financially so that you can A, do things that you love in your free time, or B, like save if you are interested in having children, if you are, you know, interested in like buying a house. I know that's something that I have friends that are starting to think about if you're, you know, in a relationship and you're thinking about getting married. Like these things start to come up in a way where I'm like, oh my god, I'm still a baby, I can't believe that I, like, I'm thinking about these things, or that I have friends that are thinking about these things, but, like, I just really like that and wanted to echo that, like, there is nothing wrong with being, like, money is going to put me in a position to, like, be able to do the things that I want in life, and it 100% is. I think, kind of going back to your question, one of the things with, like, I know that I can speak for a law, I think it's similar with medicine, sometimes when you are working on, like, internships you kind of take what you can get and I see that a lot in law school it's incredibly competitive to get an internship so my experience has just sort of been I had an interview I have an offer I'm taking it my first summer that happened to be paid and that was incredible my second summer it's not paid and I have different considerations where I'm like this is what I want to do this will set me up in my career to like take the next step this will be great um, but either way it has kind of been like I'm going to take whatever I can get so there's maybe less considerations of that. So I think it, you're not necessarily making financial considerations on its face, like taking an unpaid internship, but looking forward, okay, if I take this internship, I might have the chance to return to this agency of the government that I'm working with, which would be great for the career field that I want to work in, and would set me up down the line for something with a higher job title, or like, a position that's going to give me the work-life balance that I'm interested in with a salary that I can deal with. So I think that, like, you can kind of put those steps into place. Like, it's a little bit like playing the long game when you're in grad school. Um, but I think that, like, ultimately finances are a part of that. And the other thing that I would say is benefits. Benefits are huge. Like, either tangible benefits that, like, your company is going to offer you. You've spoken about, like, a 401k match. That's great. Health insurance is also great. Like, looking at those things that aren't necessarily the amount that's on your paycheck, but things that are going to pay off, and I think the flip side of that is also, like, work-life balance. You might be getting paid a little bit less, but if you are interested in having a job where you can go home at 5, 5.30 and be done for the night, that might be something that is, like, really valuable to you. So I think it's, like, sort of a balance of your current values, the things that you're interested in, in your lifestyle, and then you kind of check that with, like, what do I want out of my career? Where do I want to go? What do I need to do now to kind of set me up to take that next step? And also, you don't have to have this figured out all at once. No. Like, I realized, no. like, I, I remember sitting, like, on the other side of this. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, how am I going to, like, get a job and also have work-life balance and also have a budget and also save for the future? And what if I want to go to grad school? And, what if, and they're like, oh, my God, right? Like, it's scary. But you don't have to have it figured out all at once. Um, and I think that you said this at the beginning, Kate, but you have to give yourself grace to navigate this and recognize that you're gonna mess up sometimes, right? Like, it happens. You will have some weeks that you're looking at and you're like, shit, oh, oh God, it's pre-recorded. <laughs> oh boy, um, sorry, we bleep that out. Um, <laughs> you're like, wow, this is gonna be, you know, this is gonna be a no-spend week for me, right? And it's, you know, a friend asked, yeah, hey, you wanna go grab drinks? No, sorry, can't grab drinks. Do you wanna come over though and we can sit on my roof and have a conversation, right? Like, um, it's, not you're not going to get this i don't have this right in the slightest right i'm like happy to speak on it but i know that i'm it's something that i'm navigating every day and i imagine that anyone really is trying to kind of navigate every day so uh, we're, we're throwing a lot at you but don't think you have to like have this all figured out by the time you leave college So I, like I said, I kind of took a gap year because when I was in undergrad, I did some pre-law stuff. I knew that I was interested in going to law school, 
but I made the decision to graduate early. I graduated one semester early from undergrad because I was like, I'm done with this. I've done everything that I wanted to do and I feel very accomplished and I have all my credit hours, so I'm gonna go. Um, and I had the chance to kind of take a job, more of an internship, so like from the financial side, not being paid a salary, being paid like a stipend, in quotes, because it was very small. But I had the opportunity to kind of do that in an industry that I was really interested in, which was publishing. Um, had a great time. I was living in South Carolina. It's beautiful. Charleston's a great city. Um, you know, definitely on like a shoestring budget, but we were doing exactly that. Like the other people that I was kind of in my fellowship with were like, we have no money. Does anybody want to come over and we can like cook dinner? So like kind of doing the no spend things, you can still have a social life. I think that's like important to point out. You'll find, you know, people that a, get it, and you don't have to explain everything to them. They're just like, yeah, sounds good. So, knew that I was interested in going to law school, started doing some research on it, and then COVID hit. Um, like, basically right at that time, I was like, mm, you know what, I don't know if I'm loving this. What I like is when I see, like, a contract, or I like when we have an agreement with an advertiser to do X, Y, Z. Maybe I will start looking at going to law school, and I still thought it was, like, mm, maybe two, three years I'll take the LSAT while I'm still in, you know, study mode, just graduated. Um, and then COVID hit, boom, lost my first job. So that was not pleasant. Um, March 31st, 2020, they said, sorry, we don't have the money to keep paying you. So we are going to have to let you guys go. Uh, so then I thought, okay, well, I don't have anything to do. I'm moving back in with my parents, which was great. Um, they were great to let me do that. Um, you know, I feel really lucky that that was never a question of kind of what I was going to do. I was close to home and they were happy to have me. Um, so I studied for the LSAT. I think a lot of people did this. I will say my class over in the law school, much bigger than the class below us. So clearly a lot of people during COVID were like, oh, well, I guess I might as well take the LSAT, might as well make a career switch. Um, or like coming right from undergrad, guess I might as well just go to law school because I am never going to get a job in this economy. Um, so I did that. Again, like I said, there's kind of a balancing with what's the best school that I can get into for me. And I think that looking at those outcomes is like, what kind of jobs do they place students into? What kind of opportunities do they have on campus with what's it gonna cost me? Where am I getting a scholarship? I think that's one thing that's really, really different from when I remember being 18 and applying to undergrad. Um, I also went to a private university, so I wasn't really thinking about that money. I had parents who were like, we're happy to, you know, like we had planned on you going to college, they had not planned on me going to grad school, so that was a different conversation with them as I was in their house. Um, but the finances of undergrad weren't something that I ever really thought about, so when you're thinking about going to law school, especially kind of from a gap year where you either, you know, in the traditional world, and I fortunately did get another job during my gap year, so where you are getting paid, it feels really nice. Like getting those paychecks and having that freedom feels great. Um, again, this is speaking in the general and not from my experience because I was locked down in my parents' house. Um, so I think kind of balancing that, right? You're like, oh, what are the outcomes that this is going to give me and how much is it going to cost? I think that people are a lot more upfront about debt in law school. People are a lot more upfront about scholarships. Um, I think that's true of a lot of grad programs. I, I have a close friend who's doing a PhD and I know that was something similar, like what stipend are they going to offer me? Your living, um, what's it going to cost? PhDs work a little differently, but that balance is why I ended up at Villanova. You know, you look for a place that can give you the outcomes. I wanted somewhere on the East Coast. Philly's a great city. I wanted somewhere that was close to DC, close to New York, kind of having that freedom to maybe have alumni in those places. And then Villanova offered me a really generous scholarship. So it wasn't the highest ranked school that I got into. It's a great school, don't get me wrong, it's a wonderful law school with a great ranking. Um, and so I kind of balanced that. I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to have to take on very much student debt to go here. They're paying for almost all of it. Like, that's a really big consideration. And I think for people that are in a gap year, it feels a little different, right? Like, you're not just kind of rolling into the next thing. You're like, well, it's going to cost me this. And now I know what money is. And I've had money. So do I want to do that trade off? So I think then you kind of bring in the career piece of like, what is this going to get me at the end of it? What do those financial outcomes look like? That's something that people in law school will look a lot at. Like, you know, where do they place people? What kind of jobs are they going to? Are they going to these jobs where I know what they're getting paid because it's on a public salary scale? Are they placing people into like the public defender's office, which has a great name in a lot of places, even if you're not making like the most money in a PD's office, 
you can take that almost anywhere. It's a great experience. Are they placing people into the government? Are they placing people into like prestigious nonprofits? You look at all of these things and are like, okay, I think I'm going to have the outcome that I want at a cost that I can sort of bear for three years while I'm not getting paid to take it on. So it's a lot of balancing. I know I've used that word a ton. And I think kind of just like the biggest point that you've also touched on is like, it's about kind of like what's right for you. Like you'll know that you could go to a school that maybe you've never heard the name of that will like pay your way 100% of tuition, which is great. And a ton of people do that. And a ton of people have amazing outcomes from that. Or the flip side, some people are like, I only want the outcomes that Harvard or Yale or Stanford law is going to give me. I'm going to take on, and this is a terrifying number, like $200,000 in student debt because they're going to give me the outcome that I can pay that off in a couple of years. Um, so it's all about balancing. I think especially with law school, it's a really expensive undertaking for like potentially really, really incredible reward in terms of finances. So. Um, just like it really is all about balance coming from a gap year I would say to anyone who's interested in grad school taking a gap year is like the best thing that I feel like I did um, just to get a taste of the real world even though my experience was not quite what I had hoped it would be um, I think that a gap year is a great way to just be like is this investment that I want to make in my future and in a career path is it right for me or do I really like doing something different I think there's an alternate universe super close to this one where I found a great job like I don't know, maybe COVID didn't happen, stayed in that job that I was in, got another job after that in the same industry, and was super happy there. So I think it's all about, like, what's best for me, like, now, and then a gap year gives you a little bit of time to see, like, I liked this, maybe I'm more interested in whatever it was that I was interested in. So that's my recommendation, and I have friends that went right through um, that wish that they had taken one. So I think it's a great idea for anybody that is thinking about grad school. So to conclude the event, I would like to see if you have any recommendations about things in the media or books. If not, I also have some recommendations in the In terms of financial literacy? Yeah. Um, there's an account I follow on TikTok called Her First 100K um, that I'm sure you guys, or you may or may not have seen her um, sometimes. but I. I think that she has some really good advice. I personally am always interested in um, financial advice that's geared towards women because there are certain realities that we have to consider that men don't, um, right? Um, and so, like for example, I don't personally use them, but I know that like Elvest is a um, investment account that you can invest through that's entirely run by women, and so it has a focus on some different issues, but. Um, I personally have found it really important to look at female-oriented financial advice because again, like I want to have kids at some point, right? Like that's something that is going to be my future, and so that's different amounts of saving. That means that I'm going to be taking maternity leave or something like that. So um, I have found I, I encourage you if that's something that's important to you to look at female-oriented um, accounts like her first hundred k. I like that I just am totally blanking on and maybe I'll send it to you afterwards but um, that's that's my uh, I guess media plug there totally I also highly recommend um, advice that's geared more towards women um, I think a lot of times like the Dave Ramsey is like not the best advice um, and it's not the most realistic so there's a website called Refinery29 that does these things called money diaries where someone will kind of walk you through their week. They'll start out being like, here's what I make, here's what I have in savings, here's what I have in debt, like if I have a partner, here's how we split. And then they'll go through their week and share like, A, what they did, which is kind of just like a fun lifestyle read, but they'll share how much they spent. Um, so Refinery29 publishes those. I would also highly recommend because those sometimes aren't the most realistic. Like it might be someone with a crazy high salary or like someone who's doing something really specific. I know there have been a few, speaking of kids, that are like, I'm going through IVF and here's what it's like costing me for a week of you know, my life while I'm going through IVF. There's a Reddit called Money Diaries Active where just like real people will get on there and just like do their week. And it's really fun. Um, it's fun to kind of look through and find like, I'll go in and be like, I live in DC on a $75,000 salary because that's what I, you know, fingers crossed if I go into the job that I want, that's what I'd be making. Seeing how somebody splits that, right? Like, 
what are they paying in rent? What are they doing? Just because it's fun to kind of have that window into like someone's real life. And most of them are very honest. Like if something comes up and they're like, oh, I got asked to go to a happy hour, so I spent money that I wasn't expecting to spend. Like I just think it's a fun way to kind of see what real women and oftentimes like real non-binary people, I think that's mostly who it's open to. Um, so generally no cis men. Um, which again, it's nice to kind of see advice that's geared towards that, just because a lot of conventional advice isn't. Um, just to see what real people are up to and how real people kind of break down and deal with the unexpected things that like come up in your week that you're not, you know, you didn't anticipate, but here they are. Yeah, I similarly, I mean, I don't know if you guys are on TikTok or not, and I like, it feels weird to plug TikTok, but um, like the people who are like, what I spend in a week yeah. as a 22 year old living in Philadelphia, or what I spend in a week as someone taking an uh, X amount salary home, and I always also really enjoy those, in some ways just to see like what people are spending money on that I'm not, so I'm like, oh wow, like I never spend money on this, or oh, this is really interesting that they have this like savings bucket set up or something like that. So I think that the power of social media, like Reddit, like TikTok, is that you have the opportunity to not just hear from experts on this, but to actually see and hear what other people are trying to do and how they're trying to navigate things. Um, and it's a good, uh, it's a bit of like reassurance and like, okay, we're, not, we're all trying to figure this out. Some other accounts or podcasts that I have recommended are So Money and Get Good With Money. So thank you so much for your participation and comments in this uh, video today. Yeah, I was actually wondering, um, I don't people don't necessarily have a specific number, but I've heard people ask this question in previous years of like how much should you be graduating with? And I know there's like a period before you go into your job and so you know you still wanna have fun and enjoy like your last official summer or like travel. Um, but I also am like super cautious like, oh I should save that money because I don't know when exactly my first paycheck is gonna be coming. Um, so what is your like I don't feel recommendation for a range or like a percent of like what your expected salary is supposed to be that you would say that you should not touch <laughs> while you're trying to enjoy your last um, summer break. So I am, was not the smartest here and once I found out that I was getting a job and got a paycheck, I was like, okay, let's go. Like, <laughs> I did. Everybody um, does that. I yeah, also did yeah, that. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm going to be making money in the future? Well, then I can just spend everything I have right now. And I mean, I did save, um, I would say the what you should have saved up is basically like two months of rent. So well, let's just say, uh, let's just say you're trying to move to New York or DC or Philadelphia, because realistically, you're going to have to put down a security deposit and a first month's rent. And then maybe like a little bit more for like a bed or something like that. That's that was like the big expense that I had to have um, that I had saved for um, when I first graduated. I think that that's so. I think that's probably somewhere in the like, like I think I was like this the three thousand to five thousand dollar range. I think is kind of the I don't I don't know if that's I don't want to speak for other people. I don't know what is standard or not, but. Like for me, I pay fourteen hundred dollars a month for rent. So to have a security deposit in first months, I had to pay twenty eight hundred dollars. So that was something I was glad that I had and I was able to tap into. Um, but you should I'm you should have fun. So don't uh, have fun. I think just even that you're like thinking in that mindset is really good. I was gonna say the same thing. Like have fun. Um, I, yeah, I think that thinking about like first months rent, security deposit pad yourself like a little bit um and then especially like if you i think that a percentage is great i think that's probably easier to do once you know like what your salary is going to be but i think just even thinking about that and knowing that you have those expenses coming up is huge um i will say also for grad school that's something really similar so like when i graduate um i have to take the bar which is incredibly expensive like there's a ton of costs that come along with that bar prep package like paying to take it most people end up staying in a hotel so like it's exactly the same consideration. Like, I want to travel. I can't wait to like go on a trip after it's done. But first, I know what it's going to cost, so I have that kind of set aside. And I think that's a really good recommendation that you kind of touched on. Like, if you know what city you're looking at moving to, you can definitely, even if you don't have a place yet, you can estimate and then you know pad like a little bit on top of that. You know, an extra thousand dollars will be huge when you're trying to like stock your kitchen and get stuff from IKEA. And so I think just like being sort of 
responsible. Again, once you know what you're going to spend, take the rest that you like reasonably have and go have fun. Uh, but yeah, I think especially knowing like what city and kind of you also kind of touched on like if you intern in New York, it's incredibly expensive. So just thinking about like general cost of living that makes things more expensive. Like I have friends that live in Manhattan and the drinks are insane when you go out to a bar. Like. $18 for your standard cocktail. So just thinking about like where you're going to be living, I think is helpful in that. And we're always good at getting creative, right? Like you said, how you and your friends, like, okay, let's all go out and have dinner together. Like, I think it is possible to have a ton of fun and also be strategic with your money, right? Of, again, when I was an intern, oh, I should <laughs> But, right, like you can, you can have, you can not spend all of your money on cocktails out, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> yes, and there's all kinds of stuff, like again, kind of going back to like Instagram or media recommendations, there are so many accounts that are like, uh, one is like how to be broke in New York, there's one called like NYC for free, that are like, hey, this thing's happening, or like this brand is giving out free stuff, like, and I've always thought that's so fun when I'm in New York with my friends, to be like, oh my god, this skincare brand is like doing samples, let's go, and it gives you something to do, and then you also haven't spent any money, besides maybe like, you know, 250 for the subway. Um, but there's always free stuff to do, and again, like, I will say, you don't have to explain yourself to someone, like, you don't need to be like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, like, I can't afford blah blah blah, you don't have to get into those conversations, like, with someone that you don't feel comfortable with, but I have always found that being like, you know what, I'm so sorry, like, I can't swing it, would you rather, like, go sit in the park or something, almost always does the job. So there's always free things that you can do or, like, you know, less expensive things that you can do that will still let you have, like, fun in your new city and have a social life um, without breaking the bank. People want to hang out with you, right? Like, right, people want to hang out, so you can always make that happen. Thank you. Is it worth it to have a car in Philadelphia? No, in the inner city? Um, I would say no. So because I live and work in the inner city, um, I walk everywhere, and then I just, I bus primarily around, um, but I bus and I walk. And then, and, and again, right, I have, there's a certain privilege of, I am like a 20 minute walk to work, but I'm also like a 10 minute walk to the grocery store, um, and that was really important to me because I did, I knew I wasn't going to have a car coming into Philly, so uh, I kind of needed to be somewhere where I could walk everywhere, but, um, Personally, for me, I don't like. Ha I feel like I don't have a life outside of Center City, Philadelphia. But if I need to do something outside of Center City, I'll take regional rail or you know something the like. So I would say no. My roommate has a car, but she also you know she goes and dances out in Jersey. She is from more like I'm not. I'm from Colorado, so I would never get. I would never drive home. So like, for her, she has family in New Jersey, so like she drives home a lot. And so I think it probably depends on how often you're planning on leaving the area in which you have ease of public transportation use, and that might help determine things, but um, it wasn't a priority for me. I live out here near uh, the law school, so I have to have a car. Um, it is so expensive. I cannot wait to sell my car. Um, it, it, that's just another thing to think about, right? Like, if you are moving somewhere where you do need to have a car, that's a whole bunch of other expenses that are, like, kind of annoying because now you've got to insure it in case you're like me and can back into a stationary object every once in a while. Um, so I think just like a gas also is very expensive. But the flip side is you do have that freedom. Like I, you know, participate in like some community stuff that's closer to the city, so being able to drive to that is really nice. My pro tip is if you don't have a car, you will always find a friend that has a car. Like you will always be able to find somebody that has a car or like zip car, you can rent a car, you can you will figure it out. I know plenty of people that don't have a car um, that just make it work. So I would say, like, if you're somewhere that you need one, definitely think about that in your budget. But if you're in a city, like, you are probably fine, and you can find somebody that will get you around. Questions? Definitely an important topic. I never went to something like this, and I probably should have. So yeah. thanks for putting it together.